The practice of neurology, the practice of medicine, is increasingly reliant on clinical evidence to justify medical decision-making. Seldom are there instances in which a treatment is recommended because, hey, it might work. A patient in status epilepticus is not loaded with levotiracetam because, why not? The ECLIPSE and CONCEPT randomized clinical trials in children and the ESIT clinical trial in adults and children have definitively proven that levetiracetam is equivalent to phenytoin as a second-line agent for aborting seizures that do not respond to a first-line benzodiazepine. A patient's not given ropinirol for restless leg syndrome because, well, that's what we've been doing for years. We give it because trials like TREAT RLS US have proven it's highly effective and it's very well tolerated. But we don't always have the evidence we need to make the best medical decisions for our patients. In the neurointensive care unit, Dr. John Rosenberg faces this dilemma all the time. It's tricky, and that's one of the big issues with neurocritical care is you get all this data and all these numbers, and like, what do you trust? Dr. Rosenberg, you might recognize from episode 80, the meningitis that keeps coming back. Well, I'm John Rosenberg. I'm a neurocritical care fellow in New York. Dr. Rosenberg is also one of the producers of the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. And if you like our show today, you might check out the NCS podcast for their shows on optic ultrasonography and cerebral perfusion pressure in ICP monitoring. As a former co-resident of mine, it's been great to see John really dive into a career in online education. Are there other videos? Is it audio or is it video plus audio now? It's only audio. Yeah, nobody. But if you want, I can take a photo. Here. I asked Dr. Rosenberg to join me on Brainwaves again to discuss how he approaches intracranial hypertension, rising pressure inside the skull due to many types of neurologic injury, from trauma to subarachnoid hemorrhage to mass lesions like stroke and tumors, and to review best practices and the Neurocritical Care Society recommendations on how to manage these patients. You're treating a number, but like you also want to think what's the cause of that number. Welcome back to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. Today on our program, intracranial hypertension, monitoring and management, recognizing it, managing it, what the evidence is, if there is evidence, and the future of intracranial pressure monitoring. I'm your host, Jim Siegler. Don't go anywhere. Why don't I open with a case? And then you tell me what is intracranial pressure, what the actual numbers mean, uh, what is the value in monitoring for changes, uh, and how do we augment these pressure parameters? Sure. Perfect. So, you know, Dr. Rosenberg, you've seen this, I'm sure, in your practice since the coronavirus pandemic. There's so much more trauma these days. People coming in with severe TBI. I had a podcast recently. I talked about stair-related injuries, people falling down the stairs. But regardless of the mechanism, you know, we've, we see a lot of TBI, and we're, we're able to offer more to these patients than we ever have in the past. So if we just start off with a simple case, you know, a young woman uh, presents to the emergency department after being involved in a motor vehicle collision. She is ejected from the car, severe TBI, fluctuations in consciousness, impairment in consciousness. She's intubated at the scene, and we don't really have much of an exam to follow, uh, but we do get a head CT, and there's some multifocal subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, uh, without a lot of midline shift. You get to see these patients all the time, much more than I do. Walk me through kind of how you manage this sort of post-traumatic complication. Sure. So it sounds like what you're describing is a high-grade TBI patient with an abnormal CAT scan and depressed consciousness. GCS is going to be less than eight. They've been intubated. And um, we're going to, chances are they're going to have high intracranial pressure. We're going to need kind of some way to monitor that to diagnose it and to, to treat it. I could take a step back and I'll kind of talk a little bit about, give some background intracranial pressure, kind of you know what it is, the physiology, talk a little bit about the monitoring, the good and bad, invasive, non-invasive, the treatments we're gonna offer based on the monitoring and kind of how to think about treating uh, ICP. And then we can kind of go back to the case and make it, uh, like we can give specifics for the case then. So ICP, intracranial pressure is, is based on um, in the Monroe Kelly doctrine, which is that the, the cerebral space, the intracerebral space is like a closed compartment because uh, the brain is in the skull and inside the skull, the components are brain, blood vessels, and CSF. And that's what's gonna make up your ICP. Basically changes to the brain volume, blood volume, or CSF volume are all gonna increase or decrease your intracranial pressure. The causes of ICP are gonna be things that affect one of those three compartments. And the treatment for increased ICP are gonna be things that modify 
brain volume, CSF volume, and blood volume. The brain makes up about 80% of the intracranial volume, with the remaining 20% divided about equally between blood and CSF. So in many cases, the reduction of intracranial pressure is achieved by reducing the volume of this tissue, reducing vasogenic and cytotoxic edema. In thinking about how this is accomplished, the neurointensivist always returns to an essential maxim in their practice. The classic equation of critical care. A formula that illustrates the relationship between perfusion and pressure. The cerebral perfusion pressure, CPP, equals the mean arterial pressure, MAP, minus ICP. CPP equals MAP minus ICP. This means that the perfusion of blood into your brain is driven by the mean arterial pressure, and it's limited by the intracranial pressure. So your perfusion pressure to the brain is dependent on both your mean arterial pressure and your intracranial pressure. As the mean arterial pressure rises, the cerebral perfusion pressure rises. But as the ICP rises, it becomes harder and harder for the blood to perfuse the brain tissue, which is bad. High ICP can decrease perfusion to the brain. And this leads to cytotoxic injury and neuronal death. Luckily, the cerebral vasculature can compensate for these changes, and it can respond to changes in intracranial pressure or mean arterial pressure in order to provide a steady perfusion pressure to the brain, a process that you've heard of before, autoregulation. At various uh, levels of perfusion pressure to the brain, the cerebral blood flow will remain constant. And when these mechanisms fail, when the arterioles lose their ability to dilate in response to a reduction in mean arterial pressure, or constrict in response to higher MAPs, the patient's cerebral perfusion pressure drops, leading to stroke, or the perfusion pressure reaches dangerously high levels, leading to spontaneous hemorrhage or vasogenic edema, as we see in press. For an average healthy adult, CPP is maintained at a constant pressure as long as the MAP lies between 60 and 160 millimeters of mercury. And you've probably seen this curve before. But in patients with chronic hypertension, this CPP curve shifts to the right as the brain has adapted to higher mean arterial pressures. These brains learn to regulate blood flow with higher MAPs. But if the mean arterial pressure drops below 80 or 90 in patients who have chronic hypertension, then cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion pressure will fall. A key take-home point here is that many of the treatments that we have to offer patients with intracranial hypertension rely on an intact autoregulatory system. As long as we can lower a patient's intracranial pressure safely with CSF diversion and hydrocephalus or hemicraniectomy following malignant hemispheric stroke, and we keep that mean arterial pressure adequate, we can ensure that cerebral blood flow will be sufficiently maintained. The problem is, many of these conditions are associated with failing cerebral autoregulation. Dr. Rosenberg again. It's all based when you have injury to the brain. So autoregulation occurs in the arterioles and needs ATP. So when you have like a very large ischemic stroke, when you have a traumatic brain injury, the thought is that the brain is already dead, so you can't make the ATP, and therefore your arterioles can't constrict and dilate. This also happens with severe meningitis and encephalitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, major disturbances in cerebral metabolism, like hyperaminemic crisis, and other conditions. If you don't have autoregulation, then the blood volume is going to increase in the brain, and increasing that MAP is also going to increase ICP, which may decrease CPP. Generally, what we say is an ICP greater than 20 millimeters of mercury is, is bad. And that's because both the increased pressure leads to kind of sheer stress on the neurons and the increased pressure will also decrease perfusion, cerebral perfusion. One point to make real quick here is that Dr. Rosenberg and neurointensivists refer to high intracranial pressure as being greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. It's different from the opening pressure that we get when we do a lumbar puncture. It really comes from a, like observational cohort data, which shows that um, patients with ICH subarachnoid hemorrhage, high-grade TBI, who spend more time at ICPs greater than 20, have a worse outcome. And this measurement of ICP in millimeters of mercury is what we see on our ICU monitors in patients who have an external ventricular drain or another invasive probe. This is not the measurement we get with an LP. When we do an LP, we measure the pressure in centimeters of water, not millimeters of mercury. The conversion is about 0.75 to 1 millimeters of mercury to centimeters of water. So 20 millimeters of mercury on the ICP monitor in the ICU world would be about 27 centimeters of water with a spinal tap. So the normal ICP is, is probably around 3 to 15 millimeters of mercury. 5 to 20 centimeters of water. Basically, low ICP intracranial hypotension can be bad as well. Because it can lead to headaches, subdural hematomas, and sagging of the brain with pressure against the brainstem, causing Parkinsonism or even coma.
And that's usually caused by a CSF leak somewhere, disturbance of the, the, sub, the subarachnoid in the dura, basically, where CSF is leaking through the dura. And then returning to our case at Rosenberg, the young woman who had a traumatic brain injury from a motor vehicle accident, uh, you want to evaluate whether she has any signs of intracranial hypertension as a result of this TBI. You know, you mentioned that there are invasive and non-invasive ways of doing this. So at the bedside, what kind of things can we do before we start to consider putting in a bolt, putting in an EVD? Sure. So the first is basically the physical exam. And then the things that I look for are going to be uh, mental status, pupillary changes, and, and motor exam. Also, in a non-ventilated patient, you may see vital sign and respiratory pattern changes, chain stokes, crescendo, decrescendo respirations, kind of like this. or a bias respiratory pattern in which there are regular deep breaths interspersed by apnea, which may indicate severe pontine damage, like this. Supraventricular tachycardia, or bradycardia, with associated hypertension and T-wave inversions on the EKG. These can also be seen with rising intracranial pressure. More often, however, you may have a limited physical exam because the patient's intubated. In these instances, the pupil assessment can be incredibly revealing. Are the pupils reactive? Are they, is one pupil blown? Um, are they like midpoint and constricted? These are all signs of either uncle herniation or subvalsine herniation. Such an important point. One pupil may be pathologically dilated with an intracranial pressure crisis, an ICP crisis, because of something like uncle herniation, compression of the midbrain from downward mesial temporal lobe displacement, but with higher frontal lobe lesions, diencephalic lesions, or with pontine lesions, there may be impairment of sympathetic tone originating from the hypothalamus, causing bilateral meiosis, a central Horner syndrome. It's more useful to trend the pupil reactivity in a minimally responsive patient, but for somebody who's more awake... And then what's their mental status? Are they, do they have a depressed exam, difficulty following commands, difficulty with attention concentration? And then Agitation is also not unusual for an early finding in ICP crisis, but as the ICP reaches a critical threshold, impairment of consciousness and somnolence will set in with apneustic breathing and vital sign changes like we discussed due to compression of the ascending reticular activating system and other brainstem structures. And then the motor, are they able to withdraw, localize? Are they posturing, extensor, flexure posturing? Those posturing signs are all signs of increased brain injury, be it ICP or, or herniation. And then it's the constellation of both those clinical signs and then the CT image that will give you um, signs of increased ICP. To validate your suspicion of intracranial pressure rising, you'll want to confirm this. And we do this with non-invasive and invasive means, as Dr. Rosenberg mentioned. So there's a few non-invasive techniques we can use. Of these non-invasive techniques, brain imaging can be acquired and should be done, and sometimes it's suggestive of high pressure. Sulcal effacement, phasogenic edema, flattening of the globes, compartmental herniation, compression of the venous structures, sometimes ventricular megaly and transependymal flow. These are all findings you might see depending on the cause of the high ICP. And an unenhanced head CT has high specificity, but its poor sensitivity means that the CT can be normal, and yet the intracranial pressure could be life-threatening. You can use pupillometry, which looks at the NPI. The neurological pupil index. The pupillary reactivity. Technically, the NPI is a proprietary scalar index of pupil reactivity, with lower NPI readings correlating strongly with intracranial hypertension. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of transparency with the NPI, and many institutions have not incorporated it into their neurocritical care practice. People have kind of issue with just putting their trust in a proprietary algorithm that's, that, that they don't know. If you don't have the NPI pupillometer at your institution, we don't have it where I work, you could directly visualize the optic discs at the bedside, looking for papilledema and loss of spontaneous venous pulsations, which correspond with high intracranial pressure. You can also quantify the optic nerve edema by measuring optic nerve sheath diameter using ultrasonography. Ocular ultrasound. By insinating the globe, you can measure the width of the optic nerve three millimeters posteriorly. Anything wider than five millimeters in thickness indicates intracranial hypertension. You can use transcranial Dopplers, which can measure pulsatility index. The pulsatility index is effectively the difference between the systolic and diastolic velocities divided by the mean velocity of an intracranial artery. As pressure builds up in the brain, the diastolic filling of an intracranial artery, and therefore its arterial velocity, will decrease, 
which widens the difference between the systolic and diastolic velocities. It's intuitive, but just to state it simply, the greater the difference between the systolic and diastolic velocities, the higher the probability of intracranial hypertension. NEARS, quantitative EEG, and other methods have also been used to estimate ICP in the research setting, but the clinical exam, brain imaging, optic nerve sheath diameter, and occasionally TCDs are the most widely used non-invasive techniques currently in practice. Altogether, each technique gives you reasonable sensitivity and specificity for high ICP, on the order of 60 to 80 percent. And if you combine two or more of the techniques, particularly by combining optic nerve sheath measurements with TCDs, you can improve the diagnostic performance of all these tests. So good, like not perfect, but they could do a decent job. What happens when some of the data is discordant? It's tricky, and that's one of the big issues with neurocritical care is you get all this data and all these numbers, and, and, and or critical, I shouldn't say neurocritical care, I should say in critical care in general. You get all these data, all these numbers, and like, what do you trust? When I have discordant data, I rely on the overall clinical picture, and I often will start in the beginning. Just because the number isn't good and you don't agree with it doesn't mean you should ignore it. So I'll often treat it, unless it's like wildly discordant or clearly, you know, someone is following commands, but their MPI is low. Like, I won't treat that. Again, considering the whole clinical picture. I will err on the side of being more conservative and, and, and treating someone for high ICP. I just err on the side of being aggressive and still uh, treating. If, if one of those pieces shows high ICP, I'll still treat it. And then if it turns out in a few days, if there's no change in like the patient's imaging, there's no change in their exam, and that one data point is still discordant, then I'll ignore it. So with all these available non-invasive modalities all of which are generally very sensitive and specific for high ICP, none of them are the gold standard, and none of them give you the actual pressure. You need an invasive device for this, with the added advantage that quantitation of the ICP allows the neurointensivist to trend a pressure over time and to trend response to treatment. You know, the two invasive monitors we have are, you have an EVD. An external ventricular drain. And a, a bolt. Which is a parenchymal probe. Now, the decision to place them is in part going to be placed, is going to be dependent on like what's causing the increased ICP. Let's say they have hydrocephalus from like bacterial meningitis, or they have a non-communicating hydrocephalus, they have a mass lesion pushing on their ventricles or a large hemorrhage. We will probably do an EVD because that way we can uh, drain the CSF, help treat the hydrocephalus. If someone has, let's say a TBI or they have a uh, post anoxic injury from like uh, drug use or or cardiac arrest, we may put a bolt in because those patients, they may have global cerebral edema and also they may have small ventricles, like the ventricle may not be accessible in the setting of global cerebral edema. So in those cases, we'll often put a parenchymal bolt. The advantage of the EVD is that you use both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, however, you have to- you Meaning you can quantitate the intracranial pressure, often due to excessive accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid, and you can treat the pressure by diverting the CSF. However, EVDs are limited by a 5% risk of tract hemorrhage and a slightly smaller risk of severe brain infections. And you can't measure ICP continuously if you're draining fluid continuously. You have to pause one function in order to accomplish the other, which is simple enough to do. With a bolt, it does continuous ICP. The ICP is always reading every second. In addition to the number on the monitor, the intracranial pressure in millimeters of mercury, you can also get a lot of information from the waveform, like an EKG. When you put an EVD in, there's three waveforms. We call them the P1, P2, and P3 waves. And the P1 wave happens first. That is the arterial pulse onset of systole. The P1 waveform, or percussion wave, can be thought of as an indicator of cerebral perfusion, with smaller amplitudes correlating with poorer perfusion. The P2 wave is the uh, compliance wave. Compliance, as in the tolerance of the brain to withstand rising pressure, vaguely speaking. The P2 wave tends to grow with increasing intracranial pressure, reflecting poor compliance, and lower P2 waves indicate lower ICP, greater compliance. And then the P3 wave, the dichrotic wave, is the closing of the aortic valve, so offset of systole. And you look at these waveforms from left to right, with each one giving you a little bit of insight into the perfusion of the brain and the compliance of the brain. Generally, P1 should be the greatest, then P2, then P3 in terms of um, amplitude. But as we just mentioned before, if you see that P2 waveform begin to climb, and there's not really a quantitative way to do this, as the P2 climbs, it can be indicative of a less compliant brain, higher ICP. So we use that to do interventions or when we have to scale back treatment, we're just a little bit more careful if they have a non-compliant brain. 
In addition to looking at these second-by-second -second waveforms on the monitor, which correspond with each heartbeat, you'll also want to look at what are called the slow vasogenic waveforms, which is kind of like the mean intracranial pressure over several minutes. For the sake of time, and because we don't have great visuals for this, we'll skip over the slow vasogenic waveforms and the Lundberg waves. I'll just refer you to some of the reading materials in the show notes. Let's recap these two invasive monitors. So, when needed, Dr. Rosenberg starts by at least considering an invasive ICP monitor in a patient who he clinically suspects to have intracranial hypertension and whose imaging may or may not be concerning for it, for whom he thinks that awareness of the ICP may be useful in medical decision making. An EVD is diagnostic and it's therapeutic, but its use is limited to cases in which the intracranial hypertension is largely due to excessive CSF accumulation or poor resorption and a bolt can be placed in the parenchyma exclusively for monitoring purposes. The bolt does have a few other advantages, depending on what else you equip it with. So it's, it's continuous ICP. You can also use other probes like brain oxygen. Brain tissue oxygen tension, PBTO2, which reflects local oxygenation of oligemic tissue. With low PBTO2 measurements in the setting of poor autoregulation, one might increase the patient's sedation to reduce metabolic demand of the brain tissue. One might increase the mean arterial pressure, and thereby the cerebral perfusion pressure, or they may increase the arterial oxygen content. And these are some of the common practices to raise local PBTO2. You can do a depth electrode, see if you have intracranial seizures, microdialysis, looking at changes in brain chemistry. So all these kind of are adjuncts that we look for uh, brain health, things that could cause reduction in ICP or reduction in CPP. So it offers kind of a more comprehensive uh, analysis of what's going on in the brain. And for this reason, intensivists refer to it as multimodality monitoring. But what is the advantage of this? Is there an advantage? As in, an advantage of invasive monitoring over your clinical exam and non-invasive testing, does reacting to a higher ICP with invasive testing lead to better patient outcomes? There was um, a trial, the best trip trial. It was a very uh, well-done trial down in South America. They basically looked at outcomes in patients with high-grade TBIs who had a, a parenchymal monitor, and they were basically treated based on the ICP greater than 20 millimeters of mercury based on the monitor, or patients who were just treated based on exam alone. Pupillary changes, CAT scan, and changes in GCS in exam. And they actually found uh, no difference in outcomes. No difference in adverse events, no difference in ICU length of stay or six-month functional disability, and no difference in survival. There was a slight increase in the duration of ICP treatment in the clinical management arm by about a day and a half, but otherwise, patients were the same irrespective of the management style. And what we've taken away from Best Trip, which remains the only randomized clinical trial comparing medical management to invasive ICP monitoring, is that our exam is pretty good for identifying and treating elevated intracranial pressure. But um, it definitely gives credence to the idea that um, you can still do a pretty good job with good exam and non-invasive techniques. But maybe, maybe, we do need a more granular question. ICP is only one component of our neurocritical care assessment. Do other invasive diagnostic tests help us in managing our patients with severe TBI and elevated intracranial pressure? Would knowing, for example, that local PBTO2 measurements are actually falling below a critical threshold of 20 millimeters of mercury and reacting to this drop actually matter? Some of the most recent evidence from this comes from the BOOST 2 trial, which we referenced in a prior show with Dr. Monisha Kumar, episode 176. BOOST 2 was a randomized phase 2 clinical trial that was published in 2017, and it evaluated the safety of treating low PBTO2 in severe TBI. The BOOST 2 investigators found that targeted treatment of PBTO2 when it fell below 20 millimeters of mercury could improve tissue oxygenation, with an associated but non-statistically significant shift in the Glasgow outcome scale at 6 months improving with treatment. The ongoing BOOST-3 trial, a phase 3 randomized clinical trial, is currently underway, and it's expected to confirm the benefit of intervention with low PBTO2. All right, so let's get back to our patient, the young woman who sustained a severe TBI following a motor vehicle collision. You're in the neuro-ICU and you're monitoring the patient. Maybe you notice an increase in the pulsatility index on transcranial Doppler, Maybe you noticed a rising P2 waveform or a smaller NPI on quantitative pupillometry, some indicator of rising intracranial pressure or worsening brain compliance. What next? Um, so this patient came in, high-grade TBI. They have multi-compartmental hemorrhage. They have hydrocephalus, 
we put an EVD in, drain some CSF, but now we're getting an ICP reading. And let's say like the ICP is 40. So there's universal measures, pharmacological measures, and surgical measures. The universal measures you do for everyone. It doesn't matter kind of the type of injury they have, but they can be done for everyone. Head of bed to 30 degrees. This optimizes venous drainage from the brain, allowing that 6 to 7% of the intracranial compartment, the venous system, to drain. So the ICP goes down. But 30 degrees isn't enough of a gravitational challenge to prevent cerebral perfusion. As the head rises, both the ICP and the cerebral perfusion pressure will fall. Every 10 degrees of head elevation drops the ICP by 1 millimeter of mercury and the CPP by 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury. So a 30 degree head elevation is about the sweet spot to maintain good cerebral perfusion. So therefore, like they'll still have a decent CPP when they're at 30 degrees. Jugular midline, so you keep the veins open. Ensure normal thermia, because fevers can increase metabolic rate, metabolic demand, and blood flow. So you make sure they're normal thermic. Uh, and also to make sure they're ventilated, okay, that the PCO2 is okay. Generally at a goal of 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Because higher PCO2 levels increase cerebral blood flow, higher CPP, increasing the arterial blood compartment, and therefore higher ICP, but sometimes we'll try to quickly drop the PCO2 in order to reduce cerebral perfusion, lower the ICP. This effect only lasts four to six hours because there's a rebound in CPP. In terms of pharmacological treatments, basically you have your mannitol and your hypertonic saline. Those will um, decrease brain edema by driving water out of the brain and into the, into the blood vessel because you create an osm gradient with a high sodium or a high osm concentration in mannitol. You can also, you know, generally putting someone on EEG with a poor exam will do just to make sure they're not seizing. And treatment of seizures will also decrease ICP, decreasing metabolic demand. This is a core concept in neurocritical care. With intracranial hypertension, reducing the metabolic demand of brain tissue is a priority, not just because you want to prevent excitotoxicity of neurons and glia, but also because you want to limit cerebral blood flow. 20% of cardiac output is designated for the three pounds of brain we all have, and any way that we can reduce that 20% of dedicated blood volume without compromising function of the brain is what we're going to prioritize. You can also give steroids in the setting of vasogenic edema. As in the case of a tumor or inflammatory lesion, sometimes even an abscess or aneurysm with mass effect, but not in the case of edema following ischemic stroke or hemorrhage. And then the other main pharmacological treatments are, are, are sedation and paralysis basically drive down the metabolic demand through sedating them, and paralysis decreases any type of intrathoracic pressure, which can improve venous return from the brain. Better venous drainage, um, that will help their ICP. But neuromuscular blockade also increases the risk of pneumonia, sepsis, and it can limit our ability to detect motor seizures or neurological deterioration. If all else fails, a pharmacologic coma can reduce the metabolic rate of brain tissue to the lowest physiologic level. Um, I generally sedate pretty heavily with propofol and fentanyl. You'll probably see a lot of propofol or phenobarbital used to lower ICP. Propofol is a good drug. It has a quick onset of action. And while it's hepatically metabolized, it can be cleared from the body, independent of liver or renal function. It's a good drug for, for people with multi-organ failure. But if more ICP reduction is desired, and you can keep the blood pressure up, phenobarbital may be your drug of choice. It's more effective than propofol or midazolam at reducing ICP because it also reduces cerebral blood flow and CPP. But one in four patients may have significant hypotension because of it. And then obviously pentobarb is like the main, the kind of the, the last resort, <laughs> one of the last resorts, but I'll, I'll generally stick with propofol and fentanyl. At the same time that the neurointensivist is closely monitoring the ICP, getting back to that fundamental formula in critical care, CPP equals MAP minus ICP. While they're keeping the ICP at a certain goal, less than 15 millimeters of mercury, for example, the intensivist is also keeping a close eye on CPP. Pharmacologic sedatives like propofol and midazolam, especially phenobarb and pentobarb, these agents will tank your MAPs and subsequently your CPP. So intensivists also set a CPP goal. And then the kind of future of neurocritical care is now we we have these goals, 50 to 70, 60 to 90, The most recent Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines from 2016 recommend a CPP goal of 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury in TBI, and sometimes higher for conditions like aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And finally, if all else fails and the intracranial pressure remains high and it's life-threatening despite your best efforts, there's surgery. Hemicraniectomy, evacuating the lesion, and I'll put even cooling there. So uh, cooling patients is, is a last resort too.
That was a lot. Now let's recap. Considering the patient we opened up the show with, the young woman with severe TBI following a motor vehicle collision. In the ICU, she's intubated with a bolt in place, an ICP monitor. So I get called to the room. The ICP is 40. First thing I'll do, I'm going to make sure head of bed is elevated, drug is midline, and I'm going to make sure that I'm ventilating them okay. That like, look at their end title, make sure their end title is not like 50. So I'll hyperventilate them a little bit to make sure I'm blowing off CO2. Let's say I do that, ICP is 30, it's still high. I've done my universal measures, I'll go to my pharmacological treatments. So I usually give a dose of hypertonic saline or mannitol. So I give mannitol, their ICP is still high. At that point, I'm now at my second rung, I'm thinking I have to sedate them. Propofol, fentanyl, make sure they're in sync with the vent and make sure I decrease any metabolic activity. Once I'm past hypertonics, sedation, then I'm at my third line therapies, I kind of have to start reevaluating, am I missing something? Here, Dr. Rosenberg has to pivot. We talked about this recently on the show. If you're doing something that you think should work and it's not working, or new information presents itself, it's your responsibility to question, am I doing this right? What am I missing? So I'll think, patient, do they need another CAT scan? Like, could they have expanded their bleed? Or is the EBD working? So that's the classic thing. Is your monitor working? So is the EBD draining actually? So you can drop the EBD. But assuming the monitors are working, is there something I'm missing? Do I need to rescan them? Do I need to put them on EEG, make sure they're not seizing? I may empirically give them some Keppra and get an EEG. And then the next step is really going to be cool them and, and paralyze them and think about surgical options. For this patient, decompressive craniectomy or hematoma evacuation. Maybe if there's a subdural hematoma that's growing on repeat head CT, embolizing the middle meningeal artery. And then the next step after that, if there's no surgical option, is, is pentobarb. Basically put them in birth suppression. I like these cases because you still have to think, you're treating a number, but like you also want to think what's the cause of that number? Because you can just give hypertonic saline, sure, you can give more mantle, but you kind of want to think like, is there anything else going on in the body that I have to fix? Are they not being ventilated well? Are they not in sync with the ventilator? Did the bleed expand? Are they seizing? So it's, it's a combination of throwing the empiric treatment at them, but also having your differential in the back of your head about what is kind of driving the issue, what's driving the ICP. Once we have the max therapy and we have the ICP under control, we may keep them that way for you know one to two days and then kind of slowly liberalize. You know, because the swelling, like it's gonna, there's gonna be swelling and then with time the swelling will go away. So as you think the swelling is going away, you can kind of decrease your interventions. In conclusion, intracranial hypertension is a neurologic emergency. There is a plethora of observational studies showing patients who live at a higher ICP, they do worse. And you can recognize intracranial hypertension in many conditions. Brain injury, subarach, TBI, ICH. And diagnose it clinically with simple bedside exam findings. The clinical exam is still very important in these patients. Neuroimaging may give you more information as to the proximate cause of ICP elevation, but the pressure can continue to rise even after it's first detected. Close monitoring using non-invasive techniques, quantitative pupillometry, transcranial Doppler, or EEG, are all just as effective as invasive monitoring using a parenchymal monitor or external ventricular drain, according to level 1 data from the BEST TRIP trial. Ongoing studies may eventually demonstrate superiority of invasive monitoring or multimodality assessment following TBI. Who's 3 will hopefully answer that. Management is also contingent on the proximate etiology. The goal of treatment rests on interventions that can reduce swelling or the metabolic demand of brain tissue, while at the same time preserving cerebral perfusion pressure. Because you can be as goal-directed as possible, and you can also... And with close monitoring and early interventions, fatal complications and long-term disability can be prevented. It's important to treat high ICP. Having a monitor, having a close way of assessing these patients is going to save them. So that's all we got for you this week on the Brainwaves Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. I feel like I don't need to remind you at this point, but I will anyways. Brainwaves is intended for medical education only, and it should not be used for routine clinical decision making. This week's episode of Brainwaves was produced by myself, Jim Sigler, with the help of Dr. John Rosenberg out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Music for our program today was courtesy of Unheard Music Concepts, Rafael Archangel, Milton Arias, and Quincus Morera under a Creative Commons license. Our theme song was composed by Jimothy Dalton. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeone. 
For more information about what's discussed on the show, as always, please take a look at the show notes for the references to the highest yield literature on the topics, and follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care, John. Have a good one. Take care.